So, um, so we did a show last night. Uh, Lynn Tabersack and Joe Simons joined us, and uh, we're we're contemplating what we should talk about for our follow-up show. This being Thursday, a little bit after noon, and uh, we decided we'd we'd go with the the important highlights of Sunday night's debate in St. Louis between uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. So. If I may, here are the important subjects that were talked about during Sunday night's debate. Okay, now, <laughs> now that we've done that, let's move on and we're going to have a discussion about some subjects that might very well and should have been talked about, but apparently got lost in all the back and forth of skulking around each other and, uh, and, all, the, um, and all the talk about the... Uh, um, the groping and the, uh, and the adultery and, and the, the stuff that really matters to everybody about our presidential candidates. So, lead us off. Are we going to talk a little bit about, um, about homelessness? We, had we can, we can uh, definitely kick off because the previous show mm -hmm. dealt with homelessness and the, real, the reality uh, apparently at this point is as was discussed previously, the numbers of homeless people, specifically in the Danbury area, is enormous when you realize that, it, you know, you're walking down the street, you know, you got no issues, you, you have an apartment, you, you know, you have a job, and you see somebody uh, with the shopping cart or they're mm -hmm. pushing a uh, bag of uh, cans that they want to redeem and you don't twig to the fact that that person a might be homeless might need a meal uh, what is the reason behind it so the homelessness issue is sort of glossed over we don't hear enough about it out of politicians in specific uh, elections in Danbury or anywhere I don't recall that homelessness was discussed recently you mentioned that uh, the, the Monday morning while we were talking on the phone that you um, had an experience which uh, was a little bit it was eerie eye because eye-opening. Yeah, I walk, I drove past uh, the Doroth, Dorothy Day location mm -hmm. on my way to uh, another meeting, and I realized that there were at least twelve people outside waiting to be helped, mm -hmm. and the time of day, and I'm saying, wow, you mean there are more people than I, I thought would be attending that location at that time. Yeah, they fill up the uh, they fill up the soup kitchen, and, and of course, that there there are more people there than there are seats at the tables. Then people are outside waiting for someone else to finish, right? So that they can get in and, and have <coughs> and have a, and have a hot meal. Um, but how do we how do we expand our awareness so that the issues affecting specifically Dorothy Day now mm -hmm. become an issue that's discussed at the dinner table of people who are not homeless. It's not something that they should not be aware of. It's mm -hmm. not something that they shouldn't discuss. It's something that everybody needs to be aware of and apparently we're just not there yet. A lot of us, I think a lot of us have, um, have experienced um, moments of either poverty or near poverty, homelessness or near homelessness, not having enough food for our families or coming fairly close to that. That's, I think we'll all experience that at some point in our life, whether we have already or whether we are now or whether we might one day. But uh, maybe that's what it would take for us to, um, to consider the notion of volunteerism and and Mark, tell us tell us about what we talked about I, last night I, with uh, volunteerism. I mean, or maybe maybe should experience mm -hmm. something akin to that every once in a while. Mm -hmm. You know, used to as as a teenager working in a, a retail environment, and once you've been behind the counter at some point, and you realize how much grief you get, it should turn you around to never giving grief to, to a worker mm -hmm. anywhere because mm -hmm. you've been on both sides of the counter. It would seem, yeah. In, in some way, you know, it's like, I, I, 
you know, if you feel like every kid should work retail at some point or work a server job to understand why, you know, really who we are as workers. And, and talking about volunteerism, I mean, we were talking about the great need of just one kitchen and one shelter in one town, the idea of needing folks to be there overnight, and you've mm -hmm. got 365 days a year yeah. where you need someone to sit there and just watch. And there's so many, I mean, you think of how many towns have a shelter like that and need that, and it, it requires that all of us who are out in the world and don't need a shelter and don't need a soup kitchen to really step up and make it a part of the cycle of what we do as individuals, as families, you know, if you're going to go to the movies at some point, you're going to go to a park somewhere in that rotation, maybe we all need to consider, you know, a turn at the soup kitchen. Mm -hmm. And just, it, it needs to not be hidden, which I think comes back to what we were talking about. All of the important issues that weren't discussed at the debate, in some way, for all of the bluster of make America great again, so to speak, all of the things that are the problems get hidden. Mm -hmm. in the debates. It's as if there's some, let's give the failing middle class some illusion that they're still holding on and there's still the American dream and you can still mm -hmm. climb up farther rather than saying, you know what, we, we need to talk about poverty, which truly relates to more people than what is being discussed in the actual debates related. I mean, I mean, I think everyone's so cynical about the election at this point because we're not hearing things that relate to us. Even the lack of discussing of things like Syria mm -hmm. and what appears to be according to the UN Peace Council, and if you haven't seen it, go online and look at the, 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 the table discussion where the UN Peace Council essentially says that everything the US media is telling us about what is happening in Syria mm -hmm. is. is a lie. Mm -hmm. and that it is a U.S.-backed incursion. And this is from the U.N., who usually doesn't say things in such a, a, a strong <coughs> manner. And that affects all of us because we're getting drummed up into backing another war. Mm -hmm. And they want everyone to stand up with their nationalism and their patriotism and back another war against the other. And that trickles down to the other, the person who's homeless, the person who's poor. They're the other. We're not responsible for them. We're not, we don't need to worry about them. But in fact, we actually do. And so in the worldwide and all the way down, we get put in this mindset of worry about yourself and not about the people in the community as a whole. There's, and a, there's a bit of hedonism out there. <sighs> True, there is. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, from from mm. Secretary Clinton saying that Assad needs to go, to us selling two billion dollars worth of arms to Saudi Arabia, who is bombing the daylights out of Yemen, and <coughs> you know, I kind of give a shout out to, to to Murphy and Paul, who mm. actually worked together, stood up. And, I mean, it wasn't going to be a binding agreement anyway, but stood up with, I think it was 13 other, other politicians and said, we don't want this to happen. They brought it to light. They made the effort. Yeah. yeah. I mean, why, why are we selling $2 billion worth of, of arms to anyone who could eventually turn around and use them against us in some way? I mean, it's like Afghanistan. We armed the rebels, and now they're using all the weaponry against us. I mean, it's not rocket science here to realize that if the only thing our country can export is bad Hollywood blockbusters and arms, <laughs> and that's the only way we can make money, then we got to rethink what our economy is. Yep. We think what America is becoming. Yep. And a shout out to our own Chris Murphy, Senator Chris Murphy, and, and to Kentucky's Rand Paul, who, who Mark was speaking of. And uh, there's another good example of a liberal and a libertarian um, finding common ground on a very important issue that seems to elude both the Republican and Democratic parties. You know, the more, the more the news ramps up toward the election, the more it's just ignoring everything else going on in the world. I mean, you, you, I, I'm, I'm tired of seeing images of dead five-year-olds around the world, you know? And it got to the point where, 
you know, it, it, the, the, the satire reaches the point where it can't do justice to the injustice. And I thought to myself, you know, you, you, I, no one has ever had their mind changed by an anti-abortion person standing on a street corner with a photo of a fetus on a big poster trying to change someone's mind. But man, I am, I am ready to go down to the war memorial on Saturday with big posters of dead children across the world from wars that we've started and say, are, are you ready to stop this? Are you ready to stand up and say no more of the killing? I, I'm, I, you, it's, it's, yeah. And, and life, I think we'll all agree, life is precious. You know, I, we understand at the same time, I understand at the same time that, that women have more rights, more than, uh, more than, than an unborn child. But, um, but at the same time, you know, these, these little kids that are, have already been born and into a world where the, their world is torn apart by bombs from America, bombs from Russia, and bombs from terrorists. And I'm not really quite sure who's the real terrorist in these, in these circumstances, whether it's the terrorists or the terrorists or the terrorists, because terrorism by definition is terrorizing people, and no matter who's blowing themselves up or dropping a bomb or doing anything us else to, um, to, that harms human life, that's terrorism and that makes them terrorists. At some point... How, uh, how do we begin to put that forth? Do we... Mm -hmm. The child that uh, Mark, or the children that Mark mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, do we invert and become the child and see what is being done, see it through his eyes or her eyes that I have been left without a mother, uh, my family has been torn asunder, I have nowhere mm. to live but in uh, a demolished building. Yeah, good, good point and I think, and I think the, the allusion back to the, uh, the notion of that, that being homeless or being hungry at some point in your life you'll understand better the plight of people that are currently homeless or hungry. But maybe the other alternative way to, to really have the point driven home to us and really understand and really be able to empathize with other people that are in these situations is to volunteer. We talked a little bit about volunteering on the first show, about, uh, and you alluded to that, Mark, about, wow, there's 30 days in a month, one person donating one overnight per month you only need 30 people, and um, many hands make for light work, very clearly. So that if each of us donate a night per month, a night per two months, and now you only need 60 people to volunteer on that once every two month basis, and see that these are real human beings that sleep like everybody else, that eat like everybody else, that are very normal, that just happen to be down on their luck, Likewise, if, if we were in a situation in Syria or Yemen or, or some other country that's being torn up by war with many, many evildoers, terrorists, as I mentioned, and other groups which are, could certainly be called or referred to as, as terrorists, government-inspired terrorists. And, and that's exactly to, to it. To see that, to, to, to volunteer, to put yourself in that situation <laughs> and, and you could understand understand what it's like and maybe do something to help alleviate that continue. We may be the only country in the world who has such a large portion of the populace who believes they actually support war. Mm. And, and I, I find it astounding because it, it, you are asking a question a couple minutes ago, how, what, what, what is the way to, to change it? Someone has to stop. Someone has to not fire back. Someone has to stand up and say, you know what, the, the, the continue, and, and we all get sucked into it, because at the end of the day, it's like governments with fingers on the buttons sending rockets. I mean, it has nothing to do with us people. Yeah, not our fault. Nothing. Yeah. I mean, like you want to do it. You, you want to you want to say to to Russia, it's like, you know what, the, the people of this country don't want to go to war with you. Mm -hmm. It's not us. And in some way, you feel like, like you, you watch some of the videos of, of Putin talking with, with the, 
with the journalists over there. And in some way, you almost feel like he's the one trying to shout out the warning. Not the leaders here, mm -hmm. not Clinton, not mm -hmm. Trump, not the two of them going, no, we're going we're gonna to continue selling arms and we're going to continue to bomb. And you almost feel like, I, like you need everyone in this country to stand up and be like, you know what? We have no interest in war. It's them. Mm -hmm. it's, the it's, it's the one percent. It's the yeah. leaders. It's the, pe the people somehow getting voted in. And they, getting rich. And getting rich. And getting mm -hmm. rich because... You know, obviously, yep. there's money to be made yep. uh, from all different ways to, you know, subs you know, yep. uh, an arms company uh, will have need of investment money. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, I've got $2 million. I want to invest in your company. I don't care what you do with the money. Yeah. I just want something in return. Are they being used to build arms mm -hmm. that are then shipped to... What country or, you know, it, yeah, it's... Uh... Why is the most radical thing we can do right now to call for peace? Good question, Mark. That is a tremendously, that's a well, well-defined question. Our religious and we leaders are not... Put this out, we put this out to the audience, too, to think about what can we do while we continue the discussion. Get out your paper and pen or get out your thumbs and... Uh, Come up with some ideas about what you, what I, what we can do in order to send a message loud and clear that we're, um, we're not really happy about war being fought on our tax dollar, if you want to keep it as a personal thing, if you want to internalize it, but war being fought that kills somebody else's kids. For any reason. Religious For any differences. Reason, yeah. uh, Ethnic, you know, mm -hmm. th there's so many reasons yeah. that uh, it boggles the mind, and there's a good reason not to go to war. Yeah. So we can thrive peacefully. Mm -hmm. Families grow. We get older. Our children get older. Their children peacefully. Yeah. You can go to war because you're angry with this group or that group or the other group, and I, I'm well aware of this being principally Irish and not too many decades ago that the Irish Protestants and the Irish Catholics had this, uh, this little to-do for quite a few decades. A disagreement with you? A little, little disagreement with each other. And somewhere along the way, about 1994, with a lot of help from um, Bono, Bono, YouTube, and, and some politicians who did the right thing, um, that ended. And uh, since then, for better than two decades now, the Irish have gotten along pretty well. And they put aside this notion of, well, you killed my grandfather, so I'm going to kill you. The Hatfields and the McCoys. There you, another, another good example in, in American history. The Civil War. Yeah, the Civil War. Yep, yep. The, the, or the war between the states, or whatever you want to, want to refer to it as. But um, what, whether, we, whether we allow our government to go, go up against and, and to bomb an enemy because of their background and who they are, why not not go to war with other human beings because they're pretty much just like us? But what made them our enemy? What did they do that all of a sudden uh, we decided... What makes someone our enemy? Yeah. yeah what, uh, mm. <coughs> what line have they crossed? Yeah, what, what, is, what has someone done that, that defines them as our enemy? And now you have a very great expression that we've used many times, not often enough, certainly. Which one? The one, <laughs> the, well, the one, the one about where the, the dividing people up into groups or not well, dividing people into groups. Naturally, you know, it's, uh, I, I start with Bill Nye, the science guy. Mm -hmm. We are one human race. We are species of a human race. Geographically, did you have a choice where you were born or mm. did you? No. No. So we're just here because of the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Now, that's turned into uh, a total uh, quagmire where for people to start picking out, well, you're... Uh, not an American because you weren't born in this country. Yeah, I was going to say cluster, <coughs> yeah. but, I, but I, you can't say that on television, so right. continue. But the bottom line is we are all ethnically diverse. Mm -hmm. It's a 
something that we obviously had no choice in the matter where I was born, who I was born to. We're all red-blooded. I haven't yet met a person who had a different blood type. Yeah, not even blue-blooded people aren't blue-blooded. Right, and I think you mentioned something about uh, someone who's uh, biased. Would they turn down someone uh, who wanted to donate bone marrow or blood because they didn't think that they were their kind of person? So, you know, we're still trying to get up that hill and make it where we're all recognized as equals. You know, we have different levels of education and different levels of uh, loyalty, nationality, whatever you want to call it. But we can't keep operating this way where we're creating uh, dictators and allowing dictators to carry on the way they are. And, and the people that are hurt are the women, children, and the men go to fight mm -hmm. if, if that's you know what they're forced to do. In some cases, they don't want to fight, but they have no choice. So, uh, you, know. you ask the question: What makes someone an enemy? How how the greatest fraud the any government ever commits is convincing you that some person five thousand miles away who you've never met and will never meet is possibly your enemy. How? Why? For what? I don't even know them. I know they're a person. I know they probably want to have dinner. I know they probably want to wake up in the morning and have breakfast. Maybe look at the sunshine. Enjoy some flowers if there's any green grass left where we've bombed the daylights out of it. But my enemy? For what? For what? I, I don't know. It, 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 we talk about banking fraud and, and we talk about all, all election fraud and voter fraud and the, great, the greatest fraud is, is convincing all of us that, that we should hate some person we've never met because they have some trait that's different from us. And, and yet I'm not really sure that we're all convinced of that fact. And I'm no. not, not really sure if, if we worry about other people being, uh, being convinced of that, when in fact they're thinking pretty much like we are. And uh, they, uh, they, they think like us, and all we have to do is figure out a way to communicate that to them, as you mentioned before, and sh a, sh a, a, a handshake. Yeah, the I, goodness of a handshake. Survive together as a humanity, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, creating yeah. uh, fictional walls and uh, reasons I, to hate somebody. The I mean, bonds, the bonds that unite us, rather than the walls that divide us. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, there's the internet for you right there. You can reach out to people all over the world that you wouldn't right. otherwise meet, and be able to have a conversation with them, and yeah. just realize that. You know, and, and in some way, you know, we talk about not being the mainstream media. We talk about becoming the media, all of the little outlets that mm -hmm. need to get the actual, the truth out into the world. And in some way, it's, it's working under the radar of everything that we're being fed that's supposedly the truth and being blocked out from not seeing. It's when everybody starts to organize underneath and communicate online. I mean, that's, that's where it spreads. I mean, that's, that's how Bernie happened. I mean, we've mm -hmm. seen it in action. We've seen it in other countries when a million people show up in a square in Egypt. Yeah. And, but we've seen that there is actually the power of connectivity and communication and togetherness that can happen that can spread maybe that's why they just sold the rights to the internet to a private company <laughs> I don't want to be cynical I don't I don't I don't want to be cynical that's the whole point that's the whole problem then all is lost if we become cynical so we can't become cynical but we can while we have the internet and I think we'll we'll continue to because if the internet gets corrupted and or, or stolen There'll always be alternate means of communication. Well, what did we do before the internet? Yeah, what did we do before was, the internet? Was there, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. before the internet, mm -hmm. did we not fight? No, we, we fought. Yeah. We fought endlessly before the internet. And we communicated, too. We, the old-fashioned... Uh, yeah. 
dial phone. Yeah. I'm, I, yeah, I'm that old. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you mean, you mean crank? The crank, yeah, hey, there you go. Uh, Mabel, I need Stan down yeah. the street. That's when your your exchange was one. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess the point being that no matter how communication changes, the means of communication changes, but there, there'll always be, always has and always will be means of communication. Yeah. Some more personal than others, but, but I, I can't really say that fingers on a keyboard to someone that, that, that's not, that you've never met, that, that could be good communication too. Yeah, I mean, there's, I, certainly, there's certainly some good about that. As long as that person <laughs> is real on the other end. So yeah, you know, and, uh, and well, they're being, you know, I guess cynical. <laughs> <laughs> are you really who you say you are? Or? Well, as long as they're saying good things, I guess, uh, I guess that makes them real. As long as they sound, sounds, that there's a sound of humanity there, either, either visually by the text we're reading yeah. or, the, or, the, or the sound we're hearing or the, the picture we're seeing, any of those three, yeah. then, um, then, then there's, there's some humanity there. I think, I think the, we all have some humanity in us. The biggest segment of the human race that has more power than they realize are the women. Mm -hmm. Okay. They uh, obviously have some differences of opinion, but realistically, if the women were to say, enough, mm -hmm. you're killing my brother, you're killing my child, you're killing my husband, you killed my father, enough, it's, it's you know. So they need to go Lysistrata on all of us and withhold relations until the men come back from war. It's been done. I mean, it, it, that, that's, that's, it, there, it's, there, it's, it's there. classical literature right there. Yep. So, yeah. So I guess that's, um, whatever it's going to take. I guess that's, that's your homework assignment, men and women, all of you, because all of you can, can uh, agree to things that, that, that people that you love would like you to do for them in exchange for doing some things that you you want them to do for you. And with that, this has been Progressive Soup. I'm David Stevenson. Thank you for a meaningful debate. Thanks Roberto Perez, me. Mark Morash, and I'm David Stevenson. And we shall see you next Wednesday evening. Have a great day.